welcome everyone tonight. We have what I hope will be an interesting and serious conversation about anti-Semitism on college campuses. We have four fantastic guests tonight, professors at major American universities who've spoken and written about anti-Semitism on their campus and anti-Semitism on college campuses in general. I thought we'd begin by asking each of them to talk a little bit about what they've experienced over the past few months and what they feel the atmosphere on their own campus is, as well as what they've done, both locally and nationally, to combat anti-Semitism on college campuses. After those formal presentations, we'll have a bit of a discussion in which I'll pose some questions to the panel. In the interest of trying to remember everything, I'm going to introduce each of the panelists as they speak, and we'll introduce Shai Davidai, Claire Finkelstein, Gael Shiloh Malofsky, and Stephen Solomon in order, alphabetical order. And so Shai is first. He's an assistant professor of management at Columbia Business School. His research examines people's everyday judgments of themselves, other people, and society as a whole. He studies the psychological forces that shape, distort, and bias people's perceptions of the world. He has his PhD in social psychology from Cornell. He's spoken prominently and publicly about the Hamas-Israel war and has been accused of a number of unfortunate things as a result of speaking out. Um, Chai, welcome, and tell us a little bit about what your experience has been on campus since October 7th and what you see on the Columbia campus. And we know about your YouTube video, so uh, you can tell us a little bit about that as well. Thank you, thank you very much, and and uh, thank you everyone for showing up. You know, I've, I've been looking at the people that kind of coming in and from all over the country, and I saw also from from all over North America. So this is incredible to me. It shows that um, we have a real desire to fight this ill, and people want to know more how to fight it. And so I'm looking forward to the Q and A, the conversation. Uh, I can tell you a little bit about myself. You only gave me five minutes. I'll be very brief, but. Um, I grew up in Israel. I'm, I'm an Israeli professor. I moved to the U.S. for my graduate school uh, in 2010. So I've been here for 14 years. Throughout those 14 years, um, inevitably, I've seen a lot of um, reactions to flare-ups in Israel uh, and Palestine and the different uh, rounds of um, fighting that there's been. I have never seen things the way they are right now. And here's why. Up until October 7th, uh, there was a, an understanding or at least a pretense that everything that we see on campuses is completely um, ideological, right? There is this understanding that um, you take one side or you take the other side because based on the policies of one side versus the other side. Right now, what we're seeing is something completely different. Right now, we're not seeing differences in ideology, differences in politics. We're seeing hatred. And that's what led me to speak up, that what we're seeing as a reaction to October 7th, and we have to remember, everything we're seeing right now is a reaction to October 7th. When people tell you that they are protesting Israel's um, operation war in Gaza, that's a complete... Um, lie if you want to be a bit you know blunt uh, or misrepresentation if you want to be gracious right because the 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 protest on campuses started on October 8th right we at Columbia on October 9th already had two big organizations pull out put out a very strongly worded letter calling October 7th a day of resistance um you know calling Hamas uh fighters uh freedom fighters um, calling this an historic day and basically apologize, uh, justifying, excusing, and, and even celebrating October 7th. The, the thing that's most important for me to convey, and I'm looking forward to the conversations that we will all have, is that what we're seeing now is just another mutation in anti-Semitism. And this is an important thing to remember because a lot of people are, are asking themselves, is this, does this count as anti-Semitism? Does it not count for anti-Semitism? And in my book, if you are motivated by hatred towards the Jewish group 
as a group and the Jewish ende endeavor as an endeavor, then by definition, you're anti-Semitic. Now, if you think of um, if you think of anti-Semitism as a some sort of pandemic or, or epidemic that happens, you can see that it ebbs and flows throughout history. And every time the virus mutates itself, right? So in the Middle Ages, um, in the 13th, 14th, 15th century, anti-Semitism was mostly focused on religion, differences in religion, persecuting the Jews for, have, for practicing different religion. Then in the uh, 19th, 20th century with the advent of science, uh, anti-Semitism mutated and now it was persecuting Jews uh, based on race and ethnicity, right? And, and the whole ideas that led to the Nazi uh, extermination camps. What we're seeing now is another mutation where anti-Semitism is now focused on Israel as the, uh, the land of the Jewish people. And what we're seeing now is that, that unlike in, in history, where anti-Semitism was sort of the, uh, the domain of the, uh, the working class, lower class individuals, now we're seeing that the, the, the left-wing anti-Semitism in the United States is, and in Europe, is actually the domain of the highly educated, right? So people with master's degrees, with PhDs, and that's the most dangerous kind of anti-Semitism because it's anti-Semitism that masks itself as something different, using different words, using different academic uh, terms. And this is why it's so extremely important that we do not let the other side, if there, if there are sides here, do not let the other sides define for us what anti-Semitism is, and that we be very, very clear what anti-Semitism is and isn't. And I'm happy to talk more about that. I can say only one thing about Colombia, because you asked me to say, what's the, what's the feel like at Colombia? It depends on the time of day, it depends on the day, and it depends on the week. Um, you can come on, um, on a Monday, walk through campus and feel like there's nothing, you know, if, if you kind of put on blinders, maybe you don't no notice all the posters and the stickers and the flyers, and, and you feel like everything is normal. Then you come up another day or just stay a few more hours, and all of a sudden you'll have a protest. We had a protest today, a walkout from a, an academic discussion where the students felt that that was not okay because the academic discussion involved a proud Jewish professor. So it really does depend on, on where, you, where you are at what time of day, but it is a problem that we need to keep fighting so that every day, no matter what time of day, we'll have a campus that's free of anti-Semitism. Thank you very much. The next panelist is Claire Finkelstein, the Biddle Professor of Law and Professor of Philosophy and the Director of the Center of Ethics and the Rule of Law at the University of Pennsylvania. She's the founder and director of the Center of Ethics, a nonpartisan interdisciplinary institute affiliated with Penn's Annenberg Public Policy Center. She's an expert on the law of armed conflict, military ethics, and national security law, and has been a widely sought out commentator. She has a bachelor's in philosophy from Harvard and a master's in philosophy from the Sorbonne. She's written a number of pieces about anti-Semitism on campus. And so welcome, Claire, and tell us a little bit about yourself and about what you see as the environment at Penn. Thank you so much, Dr. Kadish, and uh, to everyone at, uh, at the college for, uh, at the university for organizing this, um, this panel on such an important theme. Uh, this has been a very, very difficult year on Penn's campus. Um, let me give you a little bit of background on myself. So for many years now, I have studied the law of armed conflict. I have been focused on national security. Uh, and so when October 7th happened, my first approach to the subject was as a national security expert. Uh, the board of the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law was focused on the Hamas attacks as one more instance of terrorism. Uh, we have studied the post 9-11 era as a center for many years now, uh, many different aspects of it, uh, including the legal framework uh, 
and including aspects of U.S. conduct after 9-11 uh, that we find regrettable and concerning. So the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law is not beyond criticizing a response to terror. However, we were all rather stunned when we found that uh, in the wake of the October 7th attacks, we found ourselves in the position of being the only organization on Penn's campus to be putting out a statement condemning the Hamas attacks uh, and, a stemming, uh, and supporting Israel. Uh, it was not really difficult uh, for our board to do that. It came naturally and uh, of course, the uh, Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law is not particularly oriented towards issues of anti-Semitism or towards issues relating to Israel, but rather towards the law of armed conflict more generally and national security. Uh, for those on the board, uh, it was natural to study Hamas's actions in the same light that we studied ISIS uh, and Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. There seemed to be no daylight there, except that in some ways uh, Hamas presented an even more formidable adversary, given the complexities of the tunnel system in Israel, the human shielding, and many other aspects of the war. We were surprised, therefore, uh, with the backlash to the effort to think about this war in the sober and uh, legally bounded terms of the law of armed conflict. I myself have written quite a bit um, about the law of armed conflict and started writing, as would be natural for me, given my area of expertise, on the Israel-Hamas war. And was quite amazed to find that despite my writing on other conflicts, my writing on this conflict was not greeted in the same light. In addition, I wrote an article on free speech on campus that ended up being published in the Washington Post and became quite a lightning rod. I found myself with hundreds and hundreds of anti-Semitic emails, uh, posts on Twitter, now X, and in, other, in an other fora. Um, I am quite taken aback by the degree to which scholarly positions in the domain of free, express, free expression on campus and on the law of armed conflict have suddenly made me feel like public enemy number one in another number of settings. Uh, and I think this is very emblematic of what's going on on campus. I'll tell you one more anecdote, which is in January, a number of my colleagues at Penn and I decided to take a trip to Israel. It was a brief three-day trip uh, with travel, just basically you know, five days door to door. And we went in solidarity with our Israeli colleagues and to learn and to witness uh, to the extent we could so many months later what had happened. We visited Kibbutzim. We spoke to many people who were, who were affected. I myself have been in regular touch with people in the IDF because I work with legal advisors in the military, with the U.S. Army and with the IDF and with others uh, in other militaries. When we returned from what was really largely a personal trip um, with a work interest but not sponsored by the university, there was a letter writing campaign organized against those who had attended the trip. Uh, there was a form letter sent out that um, alumni and uh, possibly students as well were encouraged to sign. They could just fill in their names and send these letters to the deans of the various schools that my colleagues and I came from. And our deans received hundreds and hundreds of letters asking the university to decry our trip, to disclaim it, to make sure people knew that it wasn't officially sponsored by the university. And they claimed to now organize a parallel trip to Gaza, which we would have had no objection to and indeed would have visited ourselves if it weren't impossible to enter and so dangerous. Um, so um, just yesterday then a doxing site was set up as this snowball has continued to grow 
<clears throat> on those of us who have uh, who participated in that trip again a purely personal trip uh, charging us featuring our pictures and charging us with scholasticide which i had to look up i had no idea what scholasticide was but apparently it was um, murdering uh, scholastic pursuits by bringing politics into the university well i would have thought that the people setting up this site were much more likely to be guilty of scholasticide than we were given that we were just visiting israel and and uh, on our personal time during vacation and uh, paying a visit to um, to our colleagues and our friends and and learning more about the situation so it has been an extremely tense atmosphere uh, i do understand that the university is in in a bind uh, but I am dismayed that there hasn't been more action taken to stop the um, accumulation of this snowball on campus, which really badly needs to be addressed. I will also just say one further word, which is that um, the Department of Education, as some of you may know, was investigating the University of Pennsylvania. And it called off the investigation because there was a lawsuit against Penn by to students and the Department of Education said that it did not want to conduct duplicative investigations, uh, that the lawsuit would sort out anything that needed to be investigated. Um, to some extent, I regret that, not that I wish trouble for my own university, but I'm very surprised that the Department of Education took that stance. Uh, given that uh, at Harvard that has not occurred, at other universities that has not occurred, where there have also been lawsuits. Um, you know, it's because, also atypical for the way the Department of Education. It is. Happens. It is. So you know, again, I don't. I, I I love my university. I, you know, I know the provost very well, and and the acting president. Obviously, we were part of the. Um, the meltdown that was the testimony uh, before the House Committee on Education and the Workforce and uh, Liz McGill, of whom I was very fond, uh, ended up stepping down. Um, but to say that there is no problem of anti-Semitism on university campuses, my own included, would be a, a, a grave mistake. All right, we'll have a chance to talk some more in a moment. Uh, let's, uh hear briefly from our other two panelists, and then we'll come back to some discussion. And I wanted to particularly follow up on some of the things you mentioned, Claire. Uh, the next speaker uh, is uh, Yael Shiloh Malofsky, a clinical associate professor at the School of Medicine at UNC Chapel Hill. She grew up on a kibbutz in Israel and received her MD from Tel Aviv University, completed a pediatric residency at Sheba Medical Center, and then relocated to North Carolina, where she joined the faculty at the Department of Neurology of UNC. And she's been outspoken in calling the university to do more to protect Israeli supporters on campus. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about yourself and elaborate on what you've done uh, to try to uh, protect Israeli supporters. Thank you. Um, thank you for organizing this. And um, I, I feel like I'm the least qualified of anyone here. I'm um, so my, my uh, kind of involvement is um, both as faculty, but maybe even more um, burning need is that I have a daughter on campus. So as a as a physician, I'm a a clinical um, neurologist. I see. Um, uh, students only through the med school when they come to us. So I don't, I don't walk on campus, um, but I am aware of, of the UNC campus through my children. So I'll, um, I want to give a slight description of what UNC uh, campus is, because unlike a lot of um, kind of uh, all of us know the um, kind of I, I think by now well aware of a lot of the um, other campuses that were just described. So the University of North Carolina is the oldest um, state university in the United States. It has thirty thousand students. North Carolina 
is uh, has very uh, small percent percentage of Jews. So I believe that on Wikipedia, from 10 million people in North Carolina, only 0.5 percent are um, Jewish. UNC campus is, according to Wikipedia, again has about five percent um, Jewish students. However, probably, so when talking to different um, um, clubs on campus, the number of people that actually are listed under some of the, the Jewish organiza organization on campus is about 400. This is a, a university of 30,000 students. Um, for Israelis on campus, which is also kind of um, a unique, in a way, I believe, situation to be in, and a very lonely one. Um, we have a WhatsApp group of Israelis on campus, uh, like many of us kind of in, in uh, the aftermath of, of um, the October 7 massacre, but also the, the um, staggering anti-Semitism, anti-Israel, we kind of joined power. So we have 14 people on our WhatsApp. This in, includes, um, um, students who, who who are not not undergrad students but uh, students who are uh, getting their phd so we're just 14. um and to to kind of um the what's going on on campus is probably similar to others so take um into it also that we're a very small minority on campus so um, October 12th, um, so actually a couple of days before October 12th, um, my son who graduated in 2020 said to me, mom, I'm looking on social media, UNC is terrible. There are terrible things happen. So um, the, you know, now well known for everyone, paragliders, posters um, of uh, Student for Justice for Palestine, the UNC, um, chapter of the Students for Justice Palestine had their demonstration on October 12th. So all of us are aware this was not a reaction to anything that Israel has done, and it had uh, paragliders. Um, this was on um, published in, in on social media, and the demonstration followed, including students yelling, we are for Hamas from the river to the sea. We all, we all know this by now. Um, the um, requests from, I, I personally wrote to the uh, chancellor saying, hey, this, this is not okay. You, you, sh you should not allow it. This is, um, and no response. Um, the university is keeping very, very political silence and not responding and not, um, not even following the 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 university um, uh, policy of, of, of uh, so that that was October twelfth. Um, following actually watching uh, Shai Davidai's uh, video that all of us watch, I was like, I, I also need to say something. And North Carolina is um, kind of more a small community. I contacted. Um, someone in the uh, Spectrum News and uh, went on campus with a um, with a, um, a, a journalist and I told this I've never I, I don't walk on campus but I walked on campus because this is where I thought would make sense to um, to sp to speak to a reporter and she took me to the, the um, south building which is where the chancellor sits in front of a huge quad of kind of this old campus and the whole steps and um, and and, and um, area kind of facing the chancellor building was in chalk um, F Zionist from the river to the sea genocide the whole thing um, so and that that was um, October 23rd Fast forward and just kind of to really briefly say a few things that are going on on campus. So, so the atmosphere is that, and actually I will say that seeing this, this uh, chalking graffiti was awful. 
was terrible to, to be in an ocean of this hate. Um, very, very, I'm Israeli, um, F Zionist. That's, that's all of my um, family is, is there. I'm, I'm, um, so, so that was one, but the next thing, when I looked around, there was none, no Israeli flag, no, we stand with Israel. No posters of, of the abducted children or n nothing, like nothing. And which also speaks to how, um, what a, a small minority we are and how well organized are these anti Semitic um, masking themselves as a, a pro Hamas, because they actually say that pro Hamas. Um, there, there were. UNC actually had a title uh, six since 2019 for, for um, a violation of, of, um, of the, the basically uh, having panels uh, speaking um, things that are, um, were never questioned, never bottled in, in um, really pro-terrorism. Um, we also had in um, November 28, uh, organized by the uh, four, actually I think five departments in the university, a panel and one of the speakers there, um, just to quote one thing that was said there, um, was that for many of us, she said, um, and I, I won't even say her name because um, for many of us, um, she she was just to clarify. She's this is going to be discussing things by a pro Hamas person. Um, for many of us, the October seven was a beautiful day, a day of resistance, um, and a, a, an attempt to condemn this speech, an attempt to have um, <coughs> condemn anti-Semitism um, in, in, in different ways within the university so far has been unsuccessful, despite having a previous violation, previous um, um, three actual title uh, six, and, and we're still um, in, in the same situation. I'll stop here. It sounds, I, there's... Yeah, so it, it sounds like a difficult situation and certainly you would be applauded for your efforts. We have one more speaker and then we'll have a bit of a discussion. Stephen Davidoff Solomon is a professor of law at UC Berkeley, a Morrison professor of law. He's chairman of the National Israel Institute, which I'll ask him to speak about. At Berkeley, he headed the Chancellor's Committee on Jewish Life and co founded the Berkeley Anti Semitism Institute. He teaches a course on anti Semitism in the law and has worked extensively with the Brandeis Institute in litigation to stop anti-Semitism. His JD is from Columbia, and he's been widely quoted calling for law firms not to hire anti-Semitic students. Uh, Stephen, tell us a little bit about what you've been doing and what the atmosphere at Berkeley's like. Thanks. Um, I just wanna say uh, the way that I'm gonna talk about this is nothing that happened post October 7th is a surprise to many of us been involved in this for the past 20 years. Uh, and so I, at Berkeley, headed the Chancellor's Committee on Jewish Life, which is, I guess, the predecessor of the wave of these anti-Semitism uh, committees that have been formed um, starting about 2016. Um, and as part of this, we were advising the Chancellor on um, Jewish issues. Uh, the committee was formed mainly uh, for donor purposes. Most of our big donors are Jewish, not surprisingly. And um, but as part of this, I was able. When you have a competing power in a large administrative university, anyone will speak to you. And the, I think it's important to say what's going on now and what the, my prior colleagues were talking about is directly a result of the structure of the university and what's going on in terms of their attitudes of the faculty, the staff, et cetera, which is that universities historically have had poor corporate governance. Um, essentially, the president runs uh, the operation. 
Um, there's a board that meets periodically. I advise Mark Rowan and his efforts with Penn. Um, and the board does not really create a powerful role. So who is the force that's acting on the university? It's, it's the faculty. Um, that's the main force that's catered to. And in the past decade, decade and a half, um, DEI efforts have become extremely prominent and almost a religion at these universities. Um, and that has resulted in a, a number of things. So one is um, DEI is not focused on Jewish students. Jews are white adjacent or white. Um, second, we have successfully established Hillel, Chabad, um, and outsourced our Jewish life. So it's not something that even student affairs really speaks about. So at Berkeley, what I was faced in 2016, 2017 coming in is um, an administration that's really focused on DEI efforts. Um, to vast departments in the arts and sciences that are where the litmus test for hiring now are ideology, not scholarship or pseudo scholarship. Uh, much of it devoted to anti-colonialism, anti-racism, um, things that are, again, their own religion, not very scholarly in my opinion, but you can make your own judgments if you can read it, it tends to be work salad. Um, and so what we did at Berkeley for sort of the last decade was we really focused on, you know, making sure Jews were at the table, making sure when DEI was looking at things, they considered Jewish issues, making sure they consulted with the Hillel rabbi. Um, but what we found and what, why I'm not surprised what happened on October 8th is that universities are oystered. Um, they're devoted to the, the issues that they face. And the departments have spent 20 years hiding, hiring people who have an ideological bent against Israel. So in 2014, 2015, together with Jesse Fried, who was just appointed the anti-Semitism committee at Harvard, we sued the American Studies Association for adopting boycott of Israel. Um, why Israel out of any other nation, right? Um, and that's the attitude that sort of comes in some of these departments and they've become really no-go zones. So this has also affected hiring. So in terms of Jewish studies, this is an issue at Columbia too. Many of the, the positions are actually in Mideast studies. And so we have four open Jewish studies positions in Mideast studies right now in Berkeley. Um, the reason why is because an anti-Zionist or someone who hates Israel, that's the Litmus, that's the gating issue to hire them, right? And it, it sort of goes down from there, unfortunately. Um, and so you have a vast array of faculty who are hired for their ideological debt and their religion that is phrased in terms of anti colonialism and sort of a, a pseudo scholarship. The PhD students that they push forth, these are the classes that they teach. And it seeps down to the students who uh, adopt the same attitude. And so for the past decade, one of the biggest issues we've had is sort of um, the social sort of exclusion of Jewish students. Um, basically in interactions, uh, students get here, you know, there, there's not much religion these days. Their religion is politics or social justice. And Jewish students would go to these places and suddenly Israel was um, the demon, right? Um, and in discussions with um, the university back about a year ago, um, I eventually resigned from all these positions, including Jewish studies, because uh, I felt that unless there were structural changes made to how the university worked in terms of who they hired, um, how they worked, um, there's vast administrative bureaucracies now in the university that um, you know, are devoted to sort of the ideology. Uh, the university spends about 20 to $30 million Berkeley on DEI efforts a year. When I asked them to fund my anti-Semitism initiative, they said no. Um, our, we have vast centers of race and gender uh, throughout the university. Um, they refuse and have refused to do anti-Semitism programming over the years. And finally, I just said, look, we've done enough. We opened a kosher kitchen, that's great. We have a DEI actually acknowledges Jewish students, but we couldn't go any farther. Um, and in fact, it all came to a crux about a year ago when student groups at the law school started adopting a bylaw saying we won't allow anti-Zionists to speak. Um, huge uproar, teams sort of refused to condemn it. Um, and so that's the sort of attitude that we went into on 
October 8th. And what we've seen since October 8th, and I'll line this up so we can get to questioning, is university administrators have the whole, it's not a surprise that all these people are new and they were not hired um, to put forth some idea of the university or otherwise they were hired for their DEI credentials. But they were hired to push forward an agenda called Ian Gay, um, um, the pen head who actually had sort of an academic background. And so suddenly they're put in a situation where there's, it's actually a small group of extremely local students, most students don't care or are positive to Israel, who are suddenly bursting out. And the universities, to, almost to a T, Columbia has been almost the worst, have refused to enforce the rules. Uh, they suddenly have developed this love of free speech. Um, they suddenly um, are passing on sort of blatant violations. And this has simply empowered students to do more. Um, and so, you know, I wrote an op-ed, uh, this is the last thing I'll say, um, you know, way back in, in November, don't hire my anti-Semitic law students, which was basically, look, don't, let's apply the real world here, which is if people endorse Hamas, maybe you should not hire them. Um, and it's not a controversial view outside of um, academia, but suddenly in academia, there's this, you know, how dare you say this? How dare you make judgments about this? We're fine to have a DEI statement from a faculty member that says they adhere to this religion. But if you actually express a different opinion that you might not want to hire someone based on another view, there, there's nothing there. Um, so that's, that's where we are. Um, you know, I'm heartened by the fact that so many people now are coming out and realizing the problems here. And I really look forward to a discussion on these issues going forward. Sure. If we could have everybody come back on. Claire as well. So um, one of the first questions I was going to ask, Stephen gave his answer to already, which is, it does appear that things are worse on college campuses than they are elsewhere in the United States. And while there have been pro-Hamas demonstrations and anti-Zionist statements made outside of college campuses, it certainly seems like the atmosphere on college campuses is worse. Um, Stephen suggested that it was the hiring of faculty over the past 15 years, perhaps, uh, I would suggest perhaps even a little bit longer. Um, what are What is everyone else's thoughts about that? Do you think that's the primary problem, the primary reason that campuses seem to be worse? Uh, and do you agree that campuses are worse than the atmosphere in the United States in general? So I'll open it up to anyone, I'll, three of you. I'll start up and I use, you know, we don't really know, like it's it's complicated to say this is there's one reason for this, right? Like, yeah, the hiring of, of anti-Semitic professors that are, I don't see them as a professor, I can say they are not academics, they're ideologues. They come into class to, to press an ideology. Um, that's part of it, but it's also institutions, right? The, the leadership saying nothing and allowing this to happen we have to remember the world in the United States and the Western world would have looked completely different if 10 or 20 uh, university presidents on October 8th came out and said, this is wrong, we will not allow it. We would have had a completely different past four and four and a half months. So it's not just that, it's the leaders. It's also the trustees, right? That are hiding behind plausible deniability. They are giving money and they are the ones keeping these universities afloat. And they are also to blame. So there's no one thing. But what I would say about campuses and why this is so important, we cannot distinguish campus life from the outside world. And I know a lot of people feel that way. It, it allows us to you know, sleep soundly at night. But we have to remember, these universities teach our teachers right, K to 12. Every person that teaches K to 12 has to have college education in the United States. They train our doctors, they train our social work workers, right? In uh, Columbia, we see the, the Columbia School of Social Work is, it's hard for me to say, but infested with Hamas apologists. These people are, are going to be therapists, people that deny the mass systematic rapes that happened just because the victims were Israeli are going to be treating victims, men and women, victims of rape. This is wrong, 
right? We, we have journalists, right? Columbia University has the Pulitzer Journalism School, one of the best journalism schools in the country. Makes you wonder why the New York Times only writes fluff pieces about Columbia's president, right? We, we cannot treat the colleges in the United States as separate entities, right? They are a hotbed right now for anti-Semitism and hatred, but it won't stop there. And the, and, and the last thing I would say about that is, even if we're able to somehow, you know, a lot of people tell me these students will grow out of it. And that's true. You know, once you have to pay your mortgage, you become less revolutionary. But you have to remember, every year, the anti-Semitic professors can get a new crop to indoctrinate, right? We can have- I, Can I just jump in with Shai? He's making a good point, but I, I agree everything is, is pretty terrible um, and this is problematic, but I think also you have to think, and also that there's many forces, but I, I think also you have to think like at Berkeley, initially our chancellor refused to issue a statement and we were like, well, you've issued statements on everything else, on Dobbs. How can you not issue a statement here? And she ultimately did, and she and but she forced us to negotiate it with the Mid East Studies Department, essentially. So the two, I don't even want to say their names because I don't. It's not worth it. But you know, and the idea is that historically, the Board of Trustees has been absent, and historically many parties have been absent and the only people who can unseat a, a president from serving two terms is is the faculty look at larry summers and so you know that is changing now and it should change i think is what shy is saying but unless you put a lot of pressure on these institutions they they're in their own bubble harvard will appoint derek pensler as head because that's all they see um, and it makes no no problem for them that that he's out of tune with 95% of Jews in in the United States because that's that's all they see and that's all they respond to. So unless you're going to make deep structural changes, now it may be happening. I don't know if you saw this shy, but the Columbia when they announced the new Columbia Provost, they didn't. It was a scientist. They didn't even mention DEI in the announcement. It was all about free speech. And so, you know, they're certainly scared and I feel bad for Liz McGill. She got a train wreck that she probably didn't deserve, but so what? I mean, that's that's the way life goes. And so I think structure, things are bad, but I think you have to think about what the structures are and how you're gonna address it. And I've, I've spoken to- Yeah, I, I have to say that despite efforts uh, that have been made by several of us to speak to other college presidents, and of course there are exceptions, but, um, the response, uh, I'm not sure that Shai isn't overestimating what college presidents can do, quite frankly, but that aside, it's certainly been disappointing that college leadership has not stood up and, and tried to fight this in a more aggressive way, and attempts to get them to do that have been largely unsuccessful. So, uh, I would say... I speak to, oh, I'm oh, sorry. sorry, Claire, I would say one thing. I, you're absolutely right. Um, like. Um, the college president's hands are, are restricted, but their mouths aren't, right? Colombia's president, now I know most about where I am. Colombia's president has not used the word Hamas once in the past five months. In, she has not given an interview. She's not given a press conference. She has not spoken about the two lawsuits and the U.S. congressional investigation about anti-Semitism, right? So while college presidents have like are limited in what they can do, they're not limited in what they can say. And right now, and again, I can only speak about Colombia, the Jewish students, faculty, staff, we just feel like we're not seen by the president. Forget like that she doesn't care about our well-being and our safety and protection. She doesn't even see us. She doesn't even care. And that's the big problem. So if I can speak yeah. to the question you originally asked, uh, Dr. Kadish, why is it different on college campuses? Why is it worse on college campuses? And I have a, a two-part answer to that. One is um, a, there's a profound generational difference. And I have this experience teaching national security every year and every year observing the um, lack of perspective that my students have, which is a widening gap, I think, on atrocity, um, on uh, the Holocaust, the uh, 
the fact that we are nearly at a point that uh, there were very few Holocaust survivors left to speak, uh, the rise in Holocaust denialism, which is extraordinary, um, the fact that so many of these students are being raised um, going to high schools where they are no longer taught the Holocaust, they are no longer taught European history. I can just say, personally, my daughter's situation in her own high school is, is like this, and we have been struggling with that and, and fighting that. Um, uh, so I think there are flaws in the secondary education that need to be addressed that really explain why when students get to, to college campuses, uh, they are a, it is a fertile ground for really not understanding the phenomenon of anti-Semitism, for really not understanding the reasons for the existence of the State of Israel and a kind of um, underlying anti-Semitism that they've been raised with which is resurgent in a way that it simply wasn't when um, the Second World War and the memory of the Holocaust was, uh, was closer to our experiences. So that's, that's one thing I want to say. Another thing that I want to say, um, and I said this in a Washington Post op-ed that got me in a lot of trouble, um, is um, we have a cult around the First Amendment. And it's a cult more in fantasy than in reality. So we, we think that we follow the First Amendment on university campuses. I don't even think that's true on public campuses, but it's certainly not too, uh, true in, on private university campuses. Um, as I said in that op-ed, um, we are bound by Title VI of the civil rights laws. We are not bound by the First Amendment as private universities, and we've actually never followed the First Amendment. That's, that's the truth of it. So um, I have chaired the Senate Committee on Academic Freedom twice. I have chaired the entire faculty Senate. I am now the chair of the law school um, Committee on Academic Freedom. The first time I heard a lot of talk about the First Amendment was this year in nearly 24 years at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I have heard years and years and years about the need to build and strengthen our community the need to avoid racial stereotyping, the need to avoid microaggressions, the need to educate our students uh, against racism, the need for greater sensitivity, the need to better educate our faculty members. Um, of course, there is um, an ongoing situation at my law school uh, with regard to a colleague of mine, Amy Wax. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. Uh, which is said to be a disciplinary matter, not a free speech matter. I do believe for the most part it is a free speech matter. Um, and uh, just this past week uh, there were articles indicating the sanctions that have been announced against her. Um, so I, I do not think that university campuses actually follow the First Amendment, but we think we do. The extraordinary thing that I've encountered this year, and I must say with a, with a profound sense of dismay and sense of betrayal after being involved in university administration in an informal, from the standpoint of the Faculty Senate, for so many years and trying so hard to support the mission to make Penn a really cohesive, supportive, um, and hate-free environment is that when we had the surfacing of hate towards Jews, the only thing that we're hearing back is First Amendment. And I find that extraordinary. Um, I think that perspective needs to change. I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, several of us have written about this for a long time, that academic freedom is, is not the same thing as the First Amendment, and nor it should be. Um, hate speech is protected, but... Uh, but we don't want that on campus. In any case, we only have a couple of minutes left. This has been a great discussion. I uh, want to just close with a last question about, do you see anything fundamentally different that we can do going forward? Each of you has made extraordinary efforts to try to fight anti-Semitism on campus and try to improve the environment for Jewish students. Um, so other than sending everybody to Turo, what, uh, what, what do you think that, uh, we can do going forward. Yael, you've uh, had a chance to speak much in the discussion, so 
you have any mm -hmm. ideas about things we can do differently going forward that would make a difference? I, I, I wanted to add to kind of all of our difficulty with, um, with university leadership, with students. Um, I actually am fairly um, shocked by, um, by Jews on campus. And I, I'll be completely honest, this is um, the 14 Israelis were fairly on the same page that uh, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism and that calling October 7 a beautiful day is unacceptable. But um, when it came to the, to the faculty council, um, the, the, um, when, so my dear friend, Ronit Freeman, that I met through this, this group of putting uh, 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 this resolution to condemn anti-Semitism. And there was only one person that was speaking for it. And the other side came fully organized with speeches and basically ambushed the whole discussion and uh, managed to get the resolution deferred indefinitely. They didn't even want to vote on it because they didn't want to come out anti-Semitic by uh, voting against resolution against anti-Semitism. And Hillel are on the same boat of um, October 7th happened and it was not a safe place for pro-Israel um, pro Jews. And, and the people actually asked me, kind of would tell me, you're so brave to speak out. How, how can I be brave? I mean, what, what can happen to me? Nothing can happen to me. Nevertheless, um, faculty on campus are not safe speaking. Now, I'm in medicine. I'm, I'm not shy who is really in the, the front of uh, or, or the rest of you. But people actually call me and say to me, um, you need to be careful. You were sitting next to Ronit during the resolution. Do you know that it was shown? So I think that we have a problem. And this is what I think that is maybe the next step is for us to, to unite uh, people that are uh, kind of on of the same uh, thought of this. That's, that, that's what I think is the only way forward um, mm -hmm. is for us to work on that. If I may add a, a more, I don't know, less, less polite response, right? I've been in academia not less time than, than everyone else here. But I've already seen that in academia, if you want to kill change, you set up a committee. If you want to kill change, you set up a conversation. You, you set up webinars like this. This is not how we're going to change. The only way we're going to change, and I'm not just talking about faculty, I'm talking about students, I'm talking about student uh, parents, I'm talking about grandparents, I'm talking about siblings. The only way we're going to fight this is if we all speak up now, not wait tomorrow, next week. A lot of people that I talk with, they, they have this imaginary red line. When they, when they cross this red line, I will speak up. Well, we've been here before in history. That red line, you once you've crossed it, you will not be able to speak up. We know how these things work, right? Now is the time to speak up. Now, some I have gotten a lot of flack and my entire career is in jeopardy for speaking up. And that's a cost that I'm willing to take, right? Because this is bigger than me, it's more important. But even if you don't wanna take this risk, and I understand when people don't, then don't speak up alone. Bring two, three, four other people and speak up together. Write letters, write letters to uh, your local newspapers. Stop donating, stop donating money. You are keeping the universities afloat. When they actually need you, that's when they will make any change. Stop sending your kids to schools that will not do things that, uh, that protect them, right? It's not enough to have these conversations because I see most of the questions in the Q&A are like, what do we do? Well, the first thing you do is speak up. The second thing you do is get someone else to speak up. And the third thing you do is you realize that this is not a Jewish problem. This is not an Israeli problem. This is an American problem. This is a question of, do we value life 
do we value liberty? The hostages is a question about life and liberty. The Israel's right to defend itself is a question of life and liberty. That's the only way we will make any change. Now, we can't do this alone, right? So I can see most people here are Jewish, but I can I hope that we're not just Jews that are concerned because everybody is sending their kids to these schools and every kid's in, in sophomore, uh, first year, sophomore, junior and senior year right now is not getting the education they deserve and that they pay for because they're not speaking up, because we're letting these pro Hamas uh, organizations completely ruin the university experience. So really, I, if any, if I can do one thing is like get the fire burning in everyone's bellies, because if you wait and wait and wait, it'll end up being too late when you actually want to act. So if I could address this very briefly, I have sure, four, four points. Number <laughs> one, administ university administrators must demand and teach civility on college campuses. This does not suppress political speech. It's how to channel political speech through the means of civil and engaged discourse. This is a life skill that students need to have rather than slinging intemperate slogans at one another they will be better people and more effective advocates if they can communicate civilly with people who disagree with them number two universities must stop taking funds from non-democratic nations especially non-democratic nations in the middle east qatari funds are in the billions of dollars in the last five years. They exceed funds from overseas nations by a staggering degree. We were all worried a few years about Chinese money. The Chinese have nothing on the Qataris. Uh, there is very likely an impact from these foreign funds and universities need to disclose how much they are taking in from non-democratic nations. Three, uh, threatening and harassing speech must be stopped on campus and must be punished. This is not a carve out from the First Amendment. It is consistent with First Amendment doctrine to punish harassing and threatening speech. There is no First Amendment problem there and we should stop pretending that there is. And four, the Holocaust needs to be mandatory instruction on every university campus. This should be a part of what is studied. It should be a part of basic education. And of course, I believe the same for high school studies. Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, we're kind of over time, but I wanted to give you a chance to wrap up and see. There have been some great suggestions made here, and I think we have yeah. to all push them forward. Do you have any other final comments? Um, send your kids to Jewish day school. Um, <laughs> Other than that, I, I do think I, I agree with everything that that has been said, and I do think that these universities need the, the donor funds more than you think. They spend massive amounts of money, and holding that back is is important. And keeping the pressure on, as Shai said, is important. I think this is an elite university problem, perhaps that we're talking about, but it, it extends everywhere. And I think it's not just Holocaust education. That's the last thing I'll say. I, I, you know, I teach anti-Semitism law in an undergraduate class. My students, none of them had heard of the Nuremberg trials. You know, they believe that Israel just existed in 1948. And with many of our fellow professors teaching ideological strains that defy the facts and circumstances, they just really don't know the history generally. And so I would say not just the Holocaust, but the the history if you look at it of what's going on and why it's here and, and what's going forward and i'm really heartened that all of you are here and i thank you for all your work thank i want to thank all of you for joining us we could probably continue this for another few hours but we've already gone over by about 10 minutes i really appreciate the perspective the courage and the activism of our four panelists we need more people around the country to work on this and I think there have been a lot of good suggestions made here tonight that hopefully we can continue pushing forward and begin to get a handle on controlling a problem that many people, I think, naively thought was gone, which is the 2,000-year-old problem of anti-Semitism, which has simply been re-manifest in the atmosphere on college campuses. And we all need to band together to fight that. 
Thanks again, and uh, look forward to speaking with you in the future.